Good evening, Senator. Welcome. Well, thank you. Very excited to be on. Thanks, everybody. We're excited to have you. Well, thank you. And I get to report on my meeting with Judge Jackson from Thursday, so that'll be good. That is special indeed. Welcome to Democracy in Peril. From the ballot box to the Supreme Court, we're happy you could join us this evening. And we have some great speakers and we wanna keep this thought in mind. How would my life change if we did not have a democratic form of government? As we watch with horror what's going on in Europe, in the Ukraine, we have to ask ourselves, how would my life change and how can I help keep democracy as a form of government? And what is my responsibility? Social justice is very important to NCNW, going all the way back to Dr. Bethune in 1935. So we're constantly thinking about social justice. And I want to welcome all my NCNW sisters and members who have joined us tonight. You know, this Thursday is we will be part of um a rally or meeting or speak out at the United States Supreme Court at 10 o'clock. I invite you to join us there where we're going to speak out in favor of swift confirmation of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson as the first woman of color, first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. And you know, I'm proud of the fact that she's black. You can't help but be proud. It is historic. But color doesn't tell you everything you need to know about a person. What really, really matters is how superbly suited Judge Jackson is by temperament, by talent, by preparation for this role at this particular time. Even from her early days as a child, she excelled at debate. She was president of her class and that class was 84% white. So leaders come in all colors for all seasons. She's been a leader for her entire life, long before she became a judge. Well, let's get to the business at hand. I wanna introduce our first amazing guest of the evening. Senator Amy Klobuchar is the first woman elected to represent the state of Minnesota in the United States Senate. Throughout her public service, she's always embraced the values that she learned as a little girl growing up in Minnesota. Her grandfather worked in the mines, the iron ore mines in northern Minnesota, 1,500 feet below ground, if you can imagine that. He must have been a hard worker with a strong work ethic. Her father, Jim, was a newspaper man, and her mother, Rose, was an elementary school teacher, just like mine was, who continued teaching until she was 70. You know, we think about the things that separate us, but there are a lot of things that, that bring us together, like being the child of a school teacher, just like Judge Jackson is. Senator Klobuchar has built a reputation in the United States for helping to strengthen the economy and support families and workers and businesses. So much so that in 2019, an analysis by Vanderbilt University ranked her as the most effective Democratic Senator in the 115th Congress. Minnesota is blessed to have her. Since arriving in the Senate, she has worked with Democrats and Republicans to get things done. 
She led the effort to pass landmark legislation to end human trafficking and combat the opioid epidemic. And Senator, you should know that ending human trafficking and is something that is very, very dear to NCNW. In fact, we have an entire national committee that focuses just on that and ending violence against women and girls. She also fought to pass the most significant consumer product safety legislation in a generation. And she is a trooper, a word my mom would use. Senator Klobuchar traveled to Selma this weekend for the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, getting into good trouble. And she didn't go by luxury jet. She went by bus, along with many of our members, including Melanie Campbell and some others. She sits on the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee, and she will explain what that means to the confirmation of Judge Jackson. Please welcome Senator Amy Klobuchar. The senator has a busy schedule and will need to leave after her remarks, but we thank her for joining us tonight. Senator Klobuchar, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the National Council of Negro Women for hosting today's event. Thank you, Janice, uh, for inviting me to share a few words. We know what this organization has done for almost 90 years. Um, to lead, to advocate for, to empower Black women. Uh, and what we are talking about today, justice and democracy, I think you all know are the greatest issues of our time. Black women have been courageously standing up and speaking out for these values. I thought about that time and time again, as we heard the stories uh, when we were in Selma and Montgomery and Birmingham over the weekend. And what was most memorable was actually Congresswoman Sewell's story of the 103 year old woman uh, who she brought as her guest to the State of the Union, who had been on that march on Bloody Sunday. And she told uh, this beautiful story about how um, her guest got to meet Barack Obama. It was one of his um, uh, earliest speeches when he was president. And everyone kept saying, oh, thank you, thank you. I rest on your shoulders. I stand on your shoulders. I wouldn't be here without you. And finally, uh, the woman said, um, it's getting really heavy on my shoulders and I need you guys to do this on your own. And the point of that story was this, we need to carry on the torch. There are so many strong women that have stood before us and you all know in your own lives who they are and now it's on us. And when you think about our country's history, less than 2% of people who have served as federal judges have been black women. It wasn't until 1966 that President Johnson nominated the first black woman to serve as a federal judge. That would be Constance Baker Motley. We've confirmed more judges now in the first year of President Biden's tenure than any president in the last four decades. And he's nominated the most diverse slate of nominees in history. We have confirmed more than 30 women to federal courts and more than two thirds of whom are women of color. And notably, as we just talked about, President Biden has nominated more black women to circuit courts than any president in history. That paves the way to my subject today. Uh, Judge Jackson, who by the way, shares a birthday with Judge Constance Baker Motley. I'm full of weird facts for you, but that is one of them. Um, and I got to be one of the first meetings with Judge Jackson. I can tell you, and I thought, um, um, it was really important um, what Janice was noting, um, the fact that she has this vast experience. And if you want to just remember a few numbers, um, she has nine years of judicial experience, write that down, more than four other justices that currently serve on the Supreme Court, more than four justices who are currently on the Supreme Court. She will also be the second justice on the court right now to have served as a trial court judge. In other words, to have overseen trials. She will be the only, only sitting member of the court to have worked as a public defender. So remember that nine years of experience as a judge, more than four other justices, one of only two with trial court experience and the only one that's been a public defender. 
And my other favorite number, well, not really favorite, because this is it, 115 Supreme Court justices have served, and she will be the first Black woman. It reminds me of when I was on the Trevor Noah show once, and I was bemoaning the fact in the U.S. Senate uh, that we've had over 2,000 male senators, and at the time we had about 50 women, and Trevor Noah said, if a nightclub had those numbers that bad, they'd shut it down. That's how I feel about the Supreme Court someday when I see their ruling, let me tell you. So it is time to see some changes on the Supreme Court. And Judge Jackson will be paving the way. After meeting with senators uh, in these two weeks, there's going to be hearings at the Judiciary Committee. We'll hear from her. You've all watched that. We'll ask questions. I know she's going to do well because she's done well in all her other hearings and has gotten bipartisan support in her three previous nominations. And I believe she will do that again. That doesn't mean everybody. That just means we will have some Republicans who are willing to do the right thing and vote for her. Second thing that is related to this because of Supreme Court precedent and throwing out a big part of the Voting Rights Act, we have a major issue uh, with representation and democracy. And Black women, again, have been on the front lines of this fight. When you think about what's going on, I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat it. There's a coordinated attack on voting rights in the country. Look at what they did in Georgia. So Reverend Warnock, who we adore here, now Senator Reverend Warnock, Senator Ossoff, they won in a runoff. Guess what? What did they do after they won? They limited the time of the runoff. Last time when they won, 70,000 Georgians registered to vote during the runoff. They cut off any registration during the runoff. That's law now in Georgia. That's why it's not just about food and water. They literally, as one North Carolina court said about another law, discriminated with surgical precision. What else? They are requiring people to put their birth date on the outside of the inside envelope. They used to do that a while ago. They took it off for the pandemic because so many people were confused. Guess what they put it back? What date do you think people put down? They put the date they filed the ballot. So this was all done to maximize confusion. And we've seen the same thing in Texas. We've seen the same thing in Iowa, New Hampshire, Montana that had same day registration for 15 years. And this time they took it away literally 15,000 people in Montana that relied on that because they changed their address or they're new to voting. And now they're gonna be all confused when they go in on election day and they can't register that day. Why? Well, my colleague, Senator Warnock said it best when he said this, some people don't want some people to vote. That's not how it's supposed to work in America. So we took the Senate on the road to the first field hearing in decades in Georgia with Reverend Warnock. We got all the information we needed. We took it back. We got the um, uh, For the People Act through the committee and then spent all summer negotiating the Freedom to Vote Act, a bill that I lead. Every Democrat, including Manchin, signed up on it. But then, of course, we couldn't get over the filibuster and the Republican blockage of allowing that vote to go forward on the bill. They were afraid of having the vote. We combined the bill with the John Lewis bill. They were afraid of having that vote together separate. I look at it this way. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. This is what's coming on going forward. One, we shed one big light spotlight on what's been going on. It's not just Georgia. It's a nationwide effort to suppress the vote. So people are much more educated at what's going on, members of Congress, journalists, you name it. Number two, we're taking this to the state, state by state fights. Number three, we have a Justice Department backing us up that are bringing cases in states like Georgia. Number four, we are working to make changes to the Electoral Count Act that messed us up on January 6th. It's no replacement the Freedom to Vote Act by any means, but it's something we need to get done. And then finally, we're trying to get budget money uh, to help uh, with voting and mail-in balloting and the like. So I just wanna end with this. I started uh, on January 6th, uh, where I was actually in charge that day of counting the ballots because of my position on the Rules Committee with Senator Blunt. And I ended that day as we first took that walk from the Senate to the House joyously um, with the women with the mahogany boxes. And then that night at four in the morning, we said we were gonna finish our job and we did. 
and Vice President Pence and Senator Blunt and myself were the only three senators left. And we walked through the broken glass with the spray painting on the columns around us, with the two women with those same mahogany boxes with the last of the electoral ballots up through Wyoming. We got to the House, House members, including the Speaker there with open arms, and we finished our work. And we declared Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, first black woman vice president, we declared them the victors. Two weeks later, under that beautiful blue sky was the inauguration. And I said that day that this was a day that our country stands up, brushes itself off and moves forward as we always do, one country under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. It was this glorious day with that blue sky and a few snowflakes and Amanda Gorman, that incredible poet in her gold coat. And I got to meet Lady Gaga, that's a whole nother story. But it was a day we will all never forget because leaders of both parties were on that stage. Well, I naively thought this is it. We're behind our president and vice president. And then what happened state by state, the voter suppression and what they couldn't do with bayonets and bear spray, they are trying to do with voter suppression. The black women of this country are going to lead the way. I know because you've done it over and over again. Just say, no, you're not going to bring us down. We're going to vote and we're going to have a fair democracy. And if we can embrace the people of Ukraine, what's happening all over the world, we better make sure we have a democracy working at home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Do you have time for just a couple of questions? Sure, of course I do. Um, I want to ask our guests, and they're, they're still howling in, into the room already. Um, we've got one, put your questions in the chat box, address your questions to hosts and panelists and we will get to them. Here's one, can you tell us more about what the Judiciary Committee hearings will look like? Okay, sure. So uh, right now, as, you, as I mentioned, uh, Judge Jackson is meeting with Senator. She's agreed to meet with anyone that wants to meet with her. Um, but then the hearings right now are scheduled to begin March 21st. So mark it on your calendar. They'll, they may try to mess with us to delay it. I was just talking to Senator Durbin about that, but I think it will be moving forward. On the first day, especially as you remember, Amy Coney Barrett was like, you know, lightning speed got through when Trump nominated her. March 21st, First day will be the opening statements from the senators, and then Judge Jackson will make her opening statement. Then the next day, which is a Tuesday and into Wednesday, we'll be asking your questions. We usually have 20 minutes to a half hour each. Some of this will be, of course, our job, um, that the, those senators that strongly support her and believe in her for this job to take on the likes of Ted Cruz. Yes, he's on the committee or uh, Josh Hawley or Tom Cotton. And so it's our job to respond to some of the things that they uh, bring up. The final day Thursday is a panel of experts. You know, you'll have representatives from the American Bar Association where she's already gotten glowing reviews in her past hearings uh, when they vet judge candidates uh, for her other jobs. And so there'll be pro and con people. And usually that gets in my, I once chaired that part of the hearing when I was a new Senator on judiciary. And I joke with my husband, it went from, um, you know, national coverage to C-SPAN one, to C-SPAN two, to C-SPAN three. So usually everyone's not watching that fourth day. Um, but, but that is uh, what happens with the hearings. And obviously we're gonna have great questions of her about her experience and different issues. So that's what you'll be seeing for the hearing. Then we have a vote on judiciary, usually it'll be a week and then it gets sometimes delayed to two weeks. But the plan is to get this done um, in April, in mid-April, uh, before we leave uh, for our Easter recess. Are you there? Oh, you're I'm muted, muted, Janice, you're muted. There you go. Hey, by I'm the way, it. every senator forgets to use the mute button, so you're in good, good company. I'm just talking away. When it comes to voting rights, Senator, what are you most concerned about heading into 2022 elections and what can we do to protect the right to vote? Well, I'm uh, concerned about one, the voter suppression that we talked about with these bills, you know, one ballot box. There was a proposal that luckily get, uh, the governor of Wisconsin was opposed to, so it never saw the light of the day, but to have only one ballot drop off box in the entire city of Milwaukee. That was an actual proposal. They actually had that in the last election in Texas in the entire county of Harris County, which includes Houston, one ballot drop off box. So I'm concerned about these kinds of laws and doing what we can, the Justice Department involved, state attorney generals involved. 
Um, but then on the next level, I'm concerned about our local election officials. They've had many, many threats. By the way, members of Congress alone, 9,000 threats, more than double or triple since January 6th. Same thing with the local election, yet they don't have the kind of security they need. A Republican election official who did the right thing in Philadelphia, who now left his job, told the story of how his kids' names were put on, on the internet. His house was put on the internet by the Trump people um, after he told the truth about what happened with counting the elections. Same thing with the Arizona Secretary of State who's now running for governor. Um, she has had Katie Hobbs, people chanting at her that they're gonna hunt her down. Um, so this is real and it's not just happening in big cities, it's happening in small towns. So making sure that we're giving them the protection they need, um, that we're passing laws that protect them, and that we also have enough um, volunteers that are willing to volunteer on election day. And then finally, getting the election certified themselves. As you know, there's been attempts in states like Arizona or Wisconsin to have partisan state legislatures disband the election boards, have them take over counting the votes. Um, and so that's going to be, of course, major lawsuits from the Justice Department, but I would really like to pass as part of this Electoral Count Act changes, uh, something that would make very clear that you have to actually count the votes. Well, thank you for that. And we do have a guest tonight who can talk firsthand about what's going on in Georgia. Um, we'll be hearing from Reverend Denise Freeman in just a little that's bit. That's great. But, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. We realize that you uh, have other obligations but we're grateful that you could spend this time with us. And we're going to turn now to Secretary of State. Hey guys. Jocelyn. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Jocelyn Benson, who I wish um, Senator, you could say just a minute and hear what she has to say, because this is a remarkable woman who's really been putting herself on the line. And I see that Helen Butler, that person who did more as much in Georgia to to make the election free and fair and open has joined us tonight. And I feel guilt that I don't have her mic open. We might have to fix that before the night is over. Helen is, is a real partner. But let me turn to um, our next guest, who is Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Now, I know that our audience is very sophisticated and you know that just like there's a Secretary of State for the United States, there is a Secretary of State for each of the 50 states. Jocelyn Benson is Michigan's 43rd Secretary of State. She is focused on ensuring elections are secure and accessible and has dramatically improved the experience for customers, for citizens who interact with her office. She's the author of a book called State Secretaries of State, guardians of the democratic process. It was the first major book on the role of secretaries of state in enforcing election and campaign finance laws. She said, and I had to put this in, in my notes about Secretary of State Benson. This book is dedicated to all of the men and women who have worked since the founding of this country to make the American system of democracy open and accessible to all. That sums up really why we're here tonight, how to make democracy open and accessible to all. She says that secretaries of state serve on the front lines before, during, and after elections. Don't you wish that every state had a secretary of state who believed that and practiced it? She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, an expert on civil rights law, education law and election law. She served as Dean of Wayne State University Law School in Detroit. She was appointed to that position when she was only 36 years old, which made her the youngest Dean, woman Dean of a top 100 accredited law school to ever be appointed. In 2015, she became one of the youngest women in history to be inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Now, earlier today, I spent some time with a certain sorority group that wears the colors crimson and cream, and some of them are from Michigan. And I just happened to mention, because I was trying to get people to come to, tonight, and they said, oh, we know Jocelyn Benson. She's great. She's wonderful. So I wanted to include that so you would know that she comes highly recommended. 
please welcome Secretary of State for the State of Michigan, Jocelyn Benson. Good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for that very kind introduction. It's really great to be here with all of you uh, and to follow uh, someone who I admire so much, like Senator Klobuchar, uh, who is really at the at the forefront of fighting for voting rights and democracy. And I'm glad that you've convened this really important discussion just a day after the commemoration of Bloody Sunday, as we know uh, so many sacrificed so much so that we can have a Voting Rights Act, including the many brave men and women who stood at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965 and faced down bully cl billy clubs and, and threats and violence simply so that they could march to Montgomery in showing support for a Voting Rights Act for all. So we uh, continue that work today while democracy is under a historic uh, effort to dismantle it. Uh, we all have the responsibility as well as the opportunity to save it in times like this, just as those who have fought before us did in their time. And we're indeed at a critical moment for the history of our democracy right now and the work you're doing to engage so many uh, about uh, the work that we must continue. Uh, for those who have done it throughout the history of our democracy uh, is really there's there's no more important subject that you could be addressing tonight. American democracy is under attack and while Senator Klobuchar has talked about what that attack looks like from the federal standpoint. Uh, she's also right in that uh, a lot of the work now to protect and defend democracy has focused solely and shifted to the states, so I want to speak with you about how this attack on democracy is impacting us at the state level. It's actually an attack that began years ago when elected officials and politicians and others began calling into question legitimate election results and taking other actions to suppress and discourage voting. Those attempts failed. We saw, in fact, record turnout across the nation in 2020, uh, and that only meant the attacks intensified, culminating in the tragedy in our U.S. Capitol on January 6th that Senator Klobuchar talked about. And I think it's important to note that those past efforts those recent past efforts to attack and, and dismantle democracy also failed because people on both sides of the aisle, people of integrity stood up and defended it. And that really is our path forward for us all to come together, build a national nonpartisan coalition of support for democracy. If we do that, we can survive this moment and emerge out of it with a more robust democracy than ever before. Uh, yet here we are right now with a choice. You know, we are in the middle of a multi-year, multifaceted, nationally coordinated effort that is seeking to undermine democracy. And that calls for all of us to build a similar nationally coordinated effort to protect and defend it. So uh, we also know, uh, though this effort is nationally coordinated, it has targets. And one of the targets, one of the, 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 the most significant targets are African Americans, just as it always has been throughout the history of our democracy. Uh, indeed, this coordinated assault on our democracy today continues the long line of efforts to suppress African Americans vote historically disenfranchised communities uh, and in some ways a reaction to the record turnout we saw in places like Milwaukee, Detroit, Atlanta, Philadelphia that in many ways impacted if not decided the 2020 presidential election. And here in Michigan we see uh, this attack play out very clearly. I oversee the elections as you heard from the state of Michigan and you know for example in 2020 a robocall to Detroit voters suggested falsely that if they vote by mail, they could be arrested uh, for prior prior trivial offenses. That was a lie. It was a lie designed to target Detroit voters and, and make them afraid in the midst of a pandemic of voting absentee or by mail. Yet we worked to overcome that through voter education. Uh, and then it continued on election day when another call went to voters in Flint, Michigan, telling them that the election had been delayed and they should go to the polls the next day. That's not the first time we've learned of that type of tactic. It's one that's been used effectively in communities of color for decades, and it happened right here in Michigan in Flint in 2020. That caught national attention. Uh, uh, both of those incidents did, but they also underscore uh, the real pernicious targeting of this effort uh, to dismantle democracy by making it more difficult, particularly for those in disenfranchised, historically disenfranchised communities to participate, and also in reaction to the historical engagement of communities of color. And it's the same, same type of thing you saw in the 1800s after the Civil War enacted new protections for African-American men to be able to vote. Then you saw the Jim Crow laws follow shortly after that. 
We saw uh, those uh, in place until the Voting Rights Act and the movement of the 1960s. Uh, and uh, now again, we see a reaction to historic enfranchisement, historic empowerment of the African American community coming in the form of an effort to make it more difficult for citizens to vote, particularly in uh, Texas, in Georgia, in Arizona, in Nevada, in Michigan, in areas of the country that are particularly growing in racial diversity. We see these laws being enacted to make it more difficult for new citizens, for young citizens, for all citizens to get their ballots, to return them on time and be assured that their voice is heard. And at the same time, we're seeing laws in place that are making it more difficult, uh, not just to vote, but easier and more difficult for us to run elections and easier for partisan officials to overturn results or reject ballots from certain communities. We're fighting one of those battles right here in Michigan, uh, where there's efforts to make it easier uh, to reject ballots because of a, um, a signature mismatch when we have very clear uh, protocols in place to protect uh, the verification and identification of voters and ensure that every valid vote is counted uh, and that only valid votes count. So as I said earlier, this is happening in every state in this country across the nation. State legislatures are trying to do everything they can to make it harder to vote and easier to overturn election results they don't like and easier to reject ballots from communities uh, that perhaps uh, they don't want to see high turnout. In fact, here in Michigan, we also had a state senator recently uh, years ago say, uh, if we are to win, a Republican state senator said, if we are to win, we must suppress the Detroit vote. Uh, and we see uh, unflinchingly efforts uh, to do just that. Um, in, addition, in addition to all of that, in addition to state legislatures and communities across the country changing the rules that enabled such high turnout in 2020 and, and before, we're also seeing efforts to put people in place who have steadfastly denied the results, the accurate results of the 2020 election, putting those individuals in places of power, overseeing elections, overseeing the certification of elections, so that if in the future they don't like election results, they could refuse to certify them simply based on their opinion, not based on any evidence, uh, and uh, certainly in an effort to upend the will of the voters. Now, if that sort of thing happens, if individuals block the certification or the actualization of an election result simply because they don't like it, we've lost our democracy. And that's really what's at stake. But I'm not without hope, and neither should you be. Democracy has prevailed every time it's been challenged again and again throughout history. And it did in 2020, as I mentioned, because people of integrity on both sides of the aisle took action, stood up for it, and made the right decision to protect the voice of the voters, despite threats that continue today. But make no mistake, these threats, whether they be to me personally or whether they be to our system, are continuing, they're escalating, and it's going to take all of us working together now to defeat them. Democracy is on the ballot this year. It's the most important issue on the ballot this November because the officials who are elected in 2022, this November, will hold power and authority over our elections in 2024. And voters all across this country, in Georgia, in Nevada, in Arizona, here in Michigan, will have a choice to either reject election deniers and appoint or elect individuals who have steadfastly protected their vote or allow uh, these uh, cynical individuals uh, to um, uh, who seek to run our elections at the behest of the former president as well as others, uh, the, the keys to the vault uh, that could potentially again upend uh, the future of our democracy as we know it. So that's why we say democracy is on the ballot this year. It's the first real chance voters will have to hold accountable those officials who lied about the 2020 election and use those lies to advance tactics that make it harder to vote and suppress communities of color. The goal of these deceivers is to make citizens confused, exhausted, as many of us are, uh, so much so that we give up and we stop fighting and we disengage and we give up on democracy. That's the ultimate goal. That is why we talk about this as being truth versus lies, but also democracy versus autocracy. I believe the American people will not allow those seeking to dismantle democracy to be successful. Uh, and I know we can overcome all of this if we, every single one of us, dig in in the months ahead and make defending democracy the most important issue of our time, building that not national nonpartisan pro-democracy coalition that all of you can build through the influence you have in your communities, through the organizations that you work with and lead, uh, and we can work together to keep voters informed and engaged to stymie the attempts to 
confuse and discourage them and continue to speak the truth to our neighbors, to our friends, to our state and local government seeking to change the laws, hold their feet to the fire, make sure that you're shining a spotlight on their efforts to make it harder for citizens to vote and easier for partisan officials to overturn election results they don't like. And in that regard, we must continue not just to vote, but demand that all valid votes are counted. Democracy prevailed in 2020, and it has in the past because we did all this. We spoke the truth, we enforced the law, and we worked to make sure that every single vote was counted and every single voice was heard. And if we continue to do just that, working together, we can again ensure democracy prevails this year and in the years ahead. And that's the path forward. We can emerge out of this moment with a more robust and stronger democracy than ever before if we dig in now and do the work to make that happen. So again, thank you for the work you're doing today, because this is a part of that effort. And thank you for having me to talk about really the view from the states, but the really the, the view and responsibility that all of us have to lead and defend and protect democracy in this critical moment. Thank you, Secretary of State Benson. You know, lawyers who graduate from Harvard have lots and lots of choices about what they want to do with their degrees and their careers. And I'm grateful to you for choosing this area of study to make your specialty and be an expert in election law. It's not easy and it's not very lucrative, but clearly you have a passion for it. We've got a question that maybe you can help us answer. Where can local citizens find a comprehensive list of changes to state legislation that affects uh, elections. Is there such a place? Can you recommend some good sources where we can find out more if we want to know more? Yes, the Brennan Center. Uh, it's just brennancenter.org has been compiling the information state by state and another organization called States United and they are just statesunited.org. Uh, they are also compiling that information state by state of the battles in each state. I would say you can look particularly to Texas and Georgia to see the game plan of what is uh, trying to play out in many other states. Those are two states that um, that have a trifecta of uh, particularly the state legislature and the governor working together to further these policies, uh, as well as the secretary of state who's complicit in advocating for them in those states. So you're seeing the model play out in those states. Uh, those of you from that state you're experiencing. Uh, and, uh, and, and so to continue to um, amplify what's happening there as a warning sign, I mean, we want to fight what's happening there, but we also want to be very clear that this is the that, that the war against democracy is about getting what we're seeing in those states happening everywhere. Uh, and so um, so being familiar with what's how how far advancing that's happening in your state and in what way uh, is key. And those two organizations, States United and the Brennan Center, are doing a great job of tracking that. I see that Donna Brazil, the the very famous and and influential commentator, is with us tonight, and. This might have been a better question for Senator Klobuchar, but are you seeing a lot of uh, le legislation around reproductive health in Michigan? What's the status of reproductive freedom in Michigan? Yeah, I mean, we are, there is a number of lawsuits as well as um, we've got a governor and attorney general uh, who are determined to uh, ensure that those rights are protected. Uh, but we still have laws on the books that if Roe v. Wade is overturned, then become law again automatically. So there uh, are efforts in place, uh, lawsuits and others that are being filed in efforts to codify Roe v. Wade into law in our state. Uh, but those efforts uh, really are also um, going to be evaluated by citizens who turn out to vote this fall. And, and so in, in that way, that issue is undeniably on the ballot as well, uh, and uh, as it is in, in, in every state in our country. So uh, and I think that also underscores, you know, the vast majority of women and citizens believe in a woman's right to choose. And, uh, uh, you know, what we're seeing in an effort to disenfranchise communities is not just about purely making it more difficult to vote. It's making it more difficult for those communities to hold elected officials accountable when they make decisions that hurt those communities, that hurt women, that hurt our freedoms. And so we have to see all of this as connected. The effort to dismantle democracy is connected to the effort to 
uh, make it more difficult to teach truth and history in schools, to uh, teach the truth about access to health services, and and uh, and and to teach the truth about the, the assault on women's rights. Uh, it's all connected, and and I think we all need to draw those lines for everyone, so that no matter what issue you care about, it all roots back to this battle battle over the ballot box that will determine our ability to uh, have power over any other issue, including our own bodies. Donna Brazil has a second question. Recently, the DOJ secured two important victories as it relates to hate crimes in Georgia and civil rights violations in Minnesota. What's the significance of these decisions, especially in Minnesota, if that's something that you're familiar with? I think it underscores why we need the federal government to be a partner. There's only, in some cases, sometimes so much we can do alone in the states. And when you have got a Justice Department on the side of voters, uh, to, weighing in, and, and as they are, uh, and uh, using the full power of the federal government to enforce the laws we do have on the books, like the Voting Rights Act, like Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, protecting uh, uh, the, the voices of voters, it does two things. One, it blocks uh, bad legislation, but it sends a message to those who would seek to pass similar legislation in other states uh, that they won't get away with it if uh, if it's in violation of the existing protections under federal law. Uh, that said, the importance of passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, can't be understated because the Justice Department and other attorneys need that Voting Rights Act back to full strength as it's been weakened by the Supreme Court in recent years. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's, there's so much we need to do, but that, we, you know, we can't I mean, it, I get emotional because I became a lawyer because I wanted to enforce the Voting Rights Act. And we're seeing play out in real time what happens in the states when you have a weakened Voting Rights Act, as we do. But with the Justice Department who can use the existing law to its fullest extent, it's very critical to demonstrate to the country, to voter suppressors in states all around the country, exactly um, what it still can do, uh, what the Voting Rights Act still can do to protect the voices of voters all around the states. You know, when I was in law school, I learned about the Voting Rights Act. And the county that I was in, Athens, Georgia, home of the University of Georgia, the Bulldogs, only about 20% of the Black vote were registered to vote. And you could only register to vote from 9 till noon and from 1 o'clock to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. That was the extent of voter registration. And when we students went to the Board of Elections to ask permission, to hold a voter registration drive. She said she couldn't do it because the Justice Department wouldn't approve it because of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Nothing could have been further from the truth. <laughs> but fortunately, you know, we were young and naive. Hmm. And I guess what bothers me about this period of time is that 50 years, 40 something years later, mm -hmm. we're fighting mm -hmm. the same fight. And it does make you tired because I think about what we could do about student debt what we could do about war, what we could do about other things if we weren't constantly relitigating this voting rights fight. That's sort of when I get emotional, so I understand. But we have another question. How can these laws be legal? In Winston-Salem, it's illegal to give someone water. This is from Aisha, who's standing in line to vote. The map has been altered and gives more opportunity to Republicans, <clears throat> despite the fact that, as you said, North Carolina, like many states, is becoming more diverse. Well, I think, um, you know, there are big questions and there are lawsuits circulating as to whether or not these laws will, apply, will violate the Voting Rights Act. So I think that's in some ways ongoing. They are laws specifically designed not just to make it so that you're thirsty when you're waiting in line for voting, um, but to cause confusion and potentially allow for the dismissal of votes from people who have been given water. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of these policies um, come at the issue from different places, but they're in, in many ways designed so that after the fact, if officials don't like the election results, they can go to court to try to dismiss valid voters' ballots based on things like this, like, well, they got water in line, so they're, so, um, because a lot of those actions, which are pernicious, and you know, I, I think you know, particularly if they're racially targeted as they are, violate the Voting Rights Act. Um, there, there's I imagine some legal strategies that would wait until that to happen, and then it, you know, the, but um, but that said, um, 
it also is an example of exactly why Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was so important, because in that case, none of these laws would have even made it past the preclearance requirement. Uh, and, um, and so it also underscores we do have Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, but it requires significant resources for a lawsuit to challenge them. I believe some are being challenged. I know more will be challenged. Uh, but I think, you know, the other thing to remember, and this is why that Voting Rights Act reauthorization is so important, is that we are we have limited tools, um, um, but but potent ones, the Constitution, the Voting Rights Act, but limited ones. So it remains to be seen how the courts are going to play out in evaluating those rules. But I do believe there's a case that those laws should be uh, deemed either unconstitutional or a violation of the Voting Rights Act or both. Senator, Senator Chair Benson, we want to thank you. You promised us 20 minutes. You've been here 40 minutes. We know that you've got a very busy schedule. But thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, as Dr. King said, you know, disappointment is finite. Hope is infinite. You inspire us to continue to be hopeful. Thank you for your work. Well, you inspire me to continue because this is we're all in this together and we all have to make these issues the most important issues for all of us to fight for again in this moment even though we're tired even though it's been decades centuries of these fights um what history teaches us is that working together we can overcome these efforts but only by working together will we so um so thank you all for stepping up for showing up for for being present for engaging and for fighting back if we all do that together um we would we can win, but I mean I I, I think it's no there's no doubt that um, women of color are going to save this democracy as they have so many times before, and um, and so I'm honored to be here with you all tonight and thank you for your leadership and your work. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Well, as we move on, we want to thank Secretary of State Benson. She was just great. I am so proud and pleased that so many of you have chosen to join us tonight. We're here from North Carolina and Texas and New York and Georgia, of course. Um, it's amazing the strength in Florida. I'm going to get in trouble if I start calling names, but I'm just looking in the chat. And from all over the United States, you thought it was important enough to spend an hour and a half or two hours of your time to talk about democracy in peril. Our next guest is someone who is not new to the NCNW family. She's one of the first people I met when I joined NCNW in Georgia. She is the president of the Georgia Coalition of NCNW. She's a nurse by profession. She previously served as Vice President of Health Services for Lindbrook, a Medicare certified life plan community in Atlanta. Professionally, Dr. Ruffin Alexander has an extensive background in clinical nursing and operational nursing home management. She is an RN and a licensed nursing home administrator. Dr. Ruffin Alexander is a graduate of the University of St. Francis in Joliet, Illinois. Some people are born to lead, I think. Darlene Ruffin Alexander was president of the Texas Nurses Association. Then she moved to Georgia and organized the Atlanta Black Nurses Association and served as its president for four years. Then she established a chapter of Gamma Phi Delta Sorority, which is an NCNW affiliate. And that chapter, Alpha Gamma chapter, needed a president, so she became its first president. Uh, she was recently elected by NCNW members in Georgia to be their president. We're grateful that she could join us this evening. Welcome, Dr. Darlene Ruffin Alexander. Thank you, Madam Executive Director Mathis, for asking me to be here on such an auspicious occasion. Democracy in peril. It is indeed my pleasure at this time to introduce someone not a stranger to Georgia and not a stranger to civil rights. The Reverend Denise Freeman is an ordained minister of the gospel and a lifelong civil rights advocate. She's a graduate of the International Theological Seminary and formerly served on the Lincoln County School Board. Reverend Freeman led voter registration efforts in her community leading up to the 2020 election. She recently made national news by gathering more than 600 signatures 
of Lincoln County voters in order to stop a move to close seven polling places and replace them with just one polling places. Much of that has gone on in our country, but this civil rights leader and an advocate for all of us thought it not robbery to get out and do her job. She once described the Bible as a playbook for social justice. She's passionate about making sure succeeding generations have what it takes to make effective citizens. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce another Georgian, Reverend Denise Freeman. Unmute yourself. Doing Janice, huh? Thank you, Dr. Ruffin, for that introduction. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in Lincoln County and why this is so important. We live in the state of Georgia where they thought it was a good idea. The good old boys thought it was a good idea to pass Senate Bill 202 um, to disenfranchise our voters. What in fact happened was when we turned the state of Georgia blue and it took everybody in the state of Georgia, every county, every voter to turn Georgia blue, the good old boys got scared and they saw the power that now lies in the hands of voters. And so they decided to make these laws to circumvent the election of Blacks and others, people of color in the future. So what happened in Lincoln County is they decided to make us a test case. And they had this theory or this idea of closing every voting precinct in the county and opening one new voting precinct in the county, which would be in mid-county. Our county is large, we're poor, we're spread out, we have no public transportation, even though uh, our local paper just last week, according to our county commissioner, says that we've had public transportation for 38 years. We first learned of that when we read it in the local paper. It has never been something that actually was, but you know, they keep compounding what they're doing the way they've always done it with lies and trickery and deceitfulness. What would this mean to the rest of not just Georgia, but the rest of the country? If this was allowed to happen in little old Lincoln County, then our thoughts was that it would happen all across the country. And listening to uh, Senator Kolbatrov and listening to uh, Secretary of State Benson, uh, I think we're on the same page with that, that we see it already happening in several states across the country as Texas, Minnesota, et cetera, and so on. So we decided to partner with our, our wonderful organization in Georgia called the Georgia Coalition's People Agenda and others. Uh, and they brought a facet to us of that we could not afford uh, to bring to ourselves. And that was legal representation, manpower, and uh, the bucks that was needed to finance the effort. <sighs> this has been an uphill battle. I heard Senator Klobuchar and Secretary Benson talk about the perils of democracy. And as a Black woman born and raised in the state of Georgia and seeing how our leadership over the years have fought so that we could have the right to vote, that we could have the right to register that we would have accessibility to precincts and polls, that we would no longer be treated like second-class citizens. And here in 2022, they wanna take our access and our rights to vote away. And we cannot stand back and be silent. 
we cannot stand back because a threat to democracy in little old Lincoln County is a threat to democracy all across the country. And this is not about, I'm just going to be plain and simple. This is about the good old boys flexing their muscles, trying to obtain power and control. And we know as Black women, strong Black women in this country and around this country, that we cannot let this happen. We cannot and will not let this go unchecked. So we put out a petition. And of course, our local good old boys did not want to certify. And, and people ask me this, so I'm going to be transparent and say this right off the bat. Our election superintendent looks like me. But she, she will not answer our open records requests. We've submitted them, lawyers have submitted them, newspapers have submitted them. And we got a letter back from the county attorney who says that she's busy and it'll be 30 days before she can uh, answer your open records request. And my thing was the law does not specify and I am not a lawyer. I am a college graduate, but not a lawyer. But I thought the law said three days to answer. It didn't say about your busy schedule. So these are the kinds of things. We have not seen the map. We have not seen the new district lines. Everything has been requested. Even the Georgia Coalition of the People's Agenda have also requested newspapers, other people. And we, to this day, know as less as we did about the changes when we first started this journey some months ago. So there is absolutely no transparency. What we will not do, we presented on February 23rd, we presented a second petition. And on that petition, we got over 25 or 26% of the elected uh, active voters. We turned that in. And to date, we have not heard. We don't know if they started certifying and counting those petitions, um, but we're not gonna give up. Whatever it takes, we're gonna work hard. Uh, we get threatened, but we <laughs> if you're doing your job, you're gonna get threatened. If you're doing your job, you're gonna fear God. You're not gonna fear man. We're, we're, we are of the mindset that democracy is in perils, it's in jeopardy. So whatever it takes to make this world, this country better for our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, then that is what we're going to do. We can't sit back and allow this to happen. We, 50 years and they're trying to take everything that was gained during the civil rights structure away from us, the civil rights movement away from us. We're not going to sit idly by and let that happen. We're not going to be quiet. If we have to go to the Senate and say, we want you as Black women across this country, if we march to the Senate and say, we want you to vote on the voting rights bill, the John Lewis Freedom Voting Bill, then that's what we must do. If we must travel to DC next Thursday to make sure that Ms. Jackson becomes the first black woman to be on the Supreme Court, then that's what we must do. We can't wait for somebody to do it for us. We have got to work and do this for ourselves. We have to let them know that we won't be bought, we won't be so we're not slaves, but we're intelligent and proactive people. And we believe in doing that which is right. And we will, you know, whoever we have to go to, to make them listen, then that's what we must do. Um, 
I didn't know exactly what I was going to say tonight, but I, I, I listen and everything that I was going to say, the previous two people have talked about it. So what I want to do is encourage everybody to take the time out and go to your local elected meetings, go to your board of elections meetings, find out what's going on make sure that everything is above board make sure that people know how to check their status as voters that is extremely important because everybody's not a miss benson secretary benson the secretary of state that we have here in georgia everybody was so afraid for him and his life when trump was when 45 whatever that former president was was making threats and conversation about him. But right after that, he came out and supported Senate Bill 202. So he, he shouldn't have been too scared. He wasn't afraid to disenfranchise African-American voters. He supported that bill. How in one way are you saying that there was no voter fraud in the election, but you support a bill that's on the premises of we've got to support this bill because of voter fraud. There was no voter fraud. Get over it. Stop the lie. The truth of the matter is it wasn't about voter fraud. It was about they were scared to death because we turned Georgia blue. Not just Atlanta, but all of Georgia voters turned the state of Georgia blue. And that's what this is about. They want to make sure that they win in 2022, but especially in 2024. That's what this is about. It's about we don't want Black folks to get any higher than where they already are. So we got to put these segregationists, these good old boys, these Jim Crow laws back on the books so we can control them. We got to make sure. Now, if we don't give a dog water or a cat water, then we can go to jail for abuse. But they think it's humane to make people stand in line trying to vote and they will get in trouble. Their vote may not count if they get some water or go to the bathroom. That's inhumane. It's, it's just wrong. And so it's in place, but whatever they put in place, Ms. Mathis, Attorney Mathis, we're not going to let it stop us. Whatever they put in place, it only empowers us. It's like Jeremiah said, it's like fire all shut up in my bones. And that they don't understand is we as African-American women, we have been through the struggle. It has never stopped for us. We are always fearful for our sons and our daughters out here in this world because of the killings of folks like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and folks, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey and so many others who have lost their lives needlessly just because of the color of their skin. We can't jog, we can't breathe, we can't lay in our bed and sleep without the fear of being killed. So this behooves us, this election coming up in 2022 and 2024, we gotta work like there's no tomorrow. And I don't, we, we gotta get over. I don't care if you don't like me, but just love me and help me. Just let's work together and do that which is right so that everybody at the end of the day, we can elect people to go to Washington DC, to go to Atlanta, Georgia, who's going to serve us and not be there for us to serve, but who gonna take their position seriously and they will become stewards and servants of the people who put them in office. See, the power belongs to the voter. That's where the power lies, is in the citizens who cast their vote. And we got to keep them, once they're elected, we got to hold their feet to the fire. We don't elect them to be rock stars. We don't elect them to be movie stars. We elect them to serve us and to do what's right and to make sure they sponsoring are the bills that's going to help every human being in this country. That's what it's about. It's been a hard fight in Lincoln. 
but the fight ain't over and we're not quitters. We don't give up and we won't stop until justice prevail, until that which is right is done. And like <laughs> I called the county commission chair Walker Norman today and I said, I want to be on the agenda Thursday. So he says, well, it's two o'clock. The deadline was 12 o'clock. You said three days prior to the meeting. This is three days prior. I didn't know about a 12 o'clock time. When did y'all come up with that rule? Every time I feel like they make a new rule for Denise Frank. And that's exactly what I said to him. I said, oh, this is another new rule for me. These are the things where we have to, I may not be on the agenda, but Thursday I'm gonna be at the meeting. See, they can silence me from speaking at the meeting, but they can't silence me from being there. And trust me, I will say what I need to say. I will not be silenced. I will not be intimidated. When they walk around my house with flashlights and good old boys, I sit in my window and I look at them and say, y'all go to bed and get some sleep. Because I'm not scared. This is no time to be afraid. This is a time for us to stand and stand together and be bold. Be bold. This ain't time for scatter cats. This is time for us to stand up and be bold. Because if they do it in this little old city of Lincoln, Georgia, Lincoln County, they will do it everywhere. We're just the test case for the rest of the country. We're the test case. And democracy means that every citizen is afforded access and the ability and the right to vote and live in this country and not be suppressed and not be disenfranchised and not be belabored and belittled, not be dehumanized. Our ancestors went through that. We're not going to go backwards. We're going to fight the good fight and we're going to continue to make good trouble. And we don't care who we have to walk over, step on and push out the way on our way up the Freedom Highway because we tired of going up Freedom Highway. We want to get there and be able to thrive and live and not just survive. I'm tired of surviving. Aren't y'all tired of surviving? It's time for us to thrive. It's time for us to live. It's time for us to have economic freedom. And I still want my 40 acres and a meal. I don't know that we have questions, but we've got plenty of comments. I'm going to copy them so you can see them, Sister Freeman. You know, whenever you put something like this together, you have some goals. And I had a couple, I had a mixed bag. I want to do a little education, wanted a little politics, wanted to sell it to you. But I know I knew why I wanted Denise Freeman here, because I knew she would get us ready to go do what needs to be done to get ready for the elections in 22, the lawsuits, the confirmation hearings, she would get us galvanized and telling us that story. And the other thing is I wanted us to know that it wasn't just Lincoln County. It's not just Georgia, it's not just Texas. It's from coast to coast in these states where is this insecurity about who's gonna be in charge. And I wanna tell them, you don't know how good government can be until you let black women run it for you. You don't need to fear. We in for a golden age of democracy when black women and good thinking sisters like Klobuchar and Benson. Yeah. I, you know, I said, somebody gonna feel some kind of way because we let the white sisters come talk. But sometimes That's you can't judge people. You don't know everything you need to know about somebody by their code. So let me just shout out a couple of people and then we're going to move on to some Q&A and we got a video that Jocelyn Tate is going to introduce for us in just a minute. Somebody said, um, preach, uh, telling you to go ahead and, and, and talk and I know you can talk, but people are here from Fayetteville, North Carolina from Montclair, New Jersey, from Michigan, from Pennsylvania. We need a coordinated national, you hear what Benson said, a coordinated national effort to suppress the vote. We need a coordinated national effort to protect the vote. And that's why we are gathered here today. 
at this point, let me calm down enough to do my job. We had invited Melanie Campbell, convener of the Black Women's Roundtable, to be with us this evening because she is not only the president and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and a proud graduate of Clark Atlanta University, but we've been allied for many years. And about eight months ago, we found, formed the United Front to urge protection of voting rights. And we held, I guess, seven or eight rallies in front of the Supreme Court. The next one will be this coming Thursday at 10 a.m. Come if you can. Support us if you cannot with your prayers and with your thoughts. Melanie can be found in just about every space where progressive thinkers are organizing for change. Black Women's Roundtable and National Council of Negro Women are partners, along with several other organizations like Power Rising, the Black Women's Collective, the Urban League, National Council of Jewish Women, A. Philip Randolph Institute. She brings young women from across the nation each year for intensive hands-on leadership training. She herself was trained by James Orange, one of the foremost leaders of the civil rights struggle of the 1960s. Unfortunately, she went to Selma. Her plane was delayed out of Atlanta because of the weather. But Black Women's Roundtable is being ably represented tonight by Jocelyn Tate, who is Senior Policy Advisor to the Black Women's Roundtable. Welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Janice, for having me. And on behalf of Melanie, I bring greetings. Um, I know she wish she could be here, but the situation being it, the way it is, I will stand in for her and, 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 stand, in, and stand in her shoes. Um, I want to introduce um, George Kenneth Butterfield Jr. He represents North Carolina's first congressional district. He was first elected in 2004, and he earned his undergraduate and law degrees from North Carolina Central University. Congressman Butterfield, Butterfield believes that if you work hard and play by the rules, you deserve a fair shot at achieving the American dream. And that's why Congressman Butterfield is working to expand opportunity to all Americans and assure that poor and middle class people have a seat at the de decision making table. From the courtroom to Congress, Congressman has always fought for equality and opportunity. He's currently involved in a state lawsuit to challenge the North Carolina congressional map as it was drawn by the state legislature. Congressman Butterfield couldn't be present with us tonight, but he was recently interviewed by Janice and Davida Mathis on Sisters in Law. What you'll hear now is a portion of that interview. Thank you, Janice. Let me say good day to all of you. I don't know if it's morning or night when our listeners will be watching this, but let me just greet each of you and thank you so very much for allowing me to come on your program. And let me just, just say that the National Council of Negro Women is very near and dear to me. Uh, I don't have time to really develop the story, but uh, the short version is that my mother was one of the founding members of NCNW North Carolina. Uh, we would always go to the national meetings in Washington, D.C. They were, they were based at the Willard Hotel there at 14th Street and uh, right near the White House. And uh, we had some wonderful, wonderful experiences there. And so as a youngster, I spent many, many days with Dorothy Hyde. And, and when I was an infant, uh, you know, I, I remember very vaguely uh, uh, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. But anyway, enough of that, but just to say thank you to the National Council of Negro Women for all that you do. Uh, I am a member of the 117th Congress, uh, was first elected 18 years ago in 2004. Uh, it's been an interesting journey over the last 17 or 18 years. I'm now considered a senior member of Congress and chairman of the Elections Committee. And so if I could just spend a few minutes uh, talking about elections in North Carolina, because that is the hot topic uh, at at this moment. Uh, every state in the union now is going through what we refer to as redistricting. Every 10 years after the census is completed, the census data is given to the states and the states are required to draw congressional districts. Every district has to be the same size, uh, not within 5,000 or 10,000 uh, people of each other, but every district has to be exactly 
the same size. And the legislature is given the prerogative of drawing the lines. And so in a state that is controlled by Republicans, as North Carolina is, uh, the Republican Party has the absolute power to draw the maps as they want the maps to be. And so we, we have been going in North Carolina through redistricting over the last few weeks, and it has been very brutal. Uh, the Republicans have a determined effort uh, to draw a map that will disenfranchise uh, not just Democratic voters, but also African-American voters as well. Uh, we have 14 seats in North Carolina, and, and the, the state is evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. So you would think that the map would, would be able to produce seven Democratic Congress members and seven Republican Congress members. That would be a fair map, um, but such is not the case. The Republicans have drawn a map here in North Carolina that is 11-3, 11, 11 Republicans and three Democrats. And we knew that, know that because we can analyze the data. We can look at past election results. We can look at other data and, and pretty much determine, you know, how voters are likely to vote. And so because of that, uh, we, we are litigating the map uh, because it is not a fair map. It is a gerrymandered map. It is gerrymandered because it, it purposely excludes a lot of Democratic communities uh, from certain districts, and it excludes African-American communities from certain districts. We have a thing in the law called packing and cracking. And that's what legislatures are doing all across the country. In some areas, they're just finding all of the African-American communities that they can to try to connect these communities together and pack them into a majority minority district. That's called packing. The opposite of that is cracking, where they find a sizable African-American community and they slice it into two or three pieces and put those two or three pieces into different congressional districts where African-Americans have little or no uh, ability to influence the outcome of the election. And so that's what's happening in North Carolina. But you know what? It's happening in other states. It's happening in Alabama. Uh, and the courts in Alabama just a few days ago found that map to be unconstitutional. They're doing it in Ohio. The Ohio Supreme Court found that map to be unconstitutional. So we're litigating maps all across the country. Right here in North Carolina, where I'm from, uh, we have an ongoing uh, case uh, involving partisan gerrymandering. It's not a case in the federal court uh, because the, the federal court has already decided that the federal constitution does not uh, allow a case for partisan gerrymandering. And so we're involved in state court uh, and, and the state courts are, are now uh, looking at the case. We, we went to the trial court uh, a few weeks ago here in North Carolina, three judge trial court, and the three judges uh, found the following. They said that all 14 districts were intentionally gerrymandered for pro-Republican candidates. That was a finding by a Republican court. That's the good news. The bad news is that the court concluded that it does not violate our state constitution. And so we lost the case. Now it's on appeal to the state Supreme Court. On our state Supreme Court, we have four Democrats and three Republicans. Of the four Democrats, two are African-American, uh, but all four of the Democratic justices are very fair-minded individuals. And I believe they will decide this case fairly and based on the law. And so by the middle of February, we are expecting a decision as to whether or not these 14 districts violate the state constitution. And we think they will find in our favor. When that happens, the legislature will then be mandated by the courts to fix the map, and we hope that it will be fixed appropriately. Uh, under this new map, the 11-3 map that we have now, it, it, uh, it, it, it creates a district where I cannot win uh, without uh, a Herculean effort, as one of the consultants told me. And so I've chosen to retire, and I'm going to pass the baton over to, to a younger candidate who can really give this thing 110 uh, percent, but the district is going to have to be redrawn, hopefully. North Carolina also picks up uh, an additional seat. I said we have 14 seats in North Carolina. Really, we have 13 right now, but under the new map, it will be 14, and the 14th seat will be a Republican seat. And so that's the long version of what's happening here in North Carolina. It's not pretty, uh, but I want you to know that we are in court and we are litigating, and hopefully we will win this lawsuit. 
and continue to have a majority, a Democratic majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. This is a monumental election year, not just for the House, but for the Senate. Uh, I'll conclude by saying that, you know, the Senate is 50-50. Everybody knows that. 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. Uh, if we lose just one seat, in the United States Senate, then we will not be able to control the agenda of the Senate and Senator McConnell or some other right wing Republican will control the business of the Senate. If we lose control of the House of Representatives, that means that McCarthy and, and other right wing Republicans will run the House and Nancy Pelosi and, and my allies, Jim Clyburn and Steny Hoya and others, we will be we will be placed on the sideline. And so please, ma'am, please, sir, as we say in the church down south, please, ma'am, please, sir, please get involved in this election. Please get everyone within your orbit to become registered voters. And let's have a 100% turnout in this election. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful primer on uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. Uh, will the case in North Carolina be decided before the election in 2022? Yes, the courts have put a stop to the election and it will be decided before the election. The election was scheduled for March. The courts have put it off until May. And if need be, it will be put off even longer if necessary to complete the litigation. Now, remember when, when the courts give the map back to the legislature to redraw it, the map that the legislature might, might, might tell the, the court, uh, forget it. Uh, we're not going to meet the spirit of your order. And they may send back another bad map. Uh, if that were to happen, then the elections would have to be delayed even further, but then the court would then have the authority to draw the new map by appointing a special master who is a neutral person, an expert who could come up with a map that is probably a 7-7 map, which would be the, the, best, the best map. What is the political balance in the North Carolina legislature at this time, Congressman? It's overwhelmingly Republican in both the House and the Senate, uh, but it is it is not veto proof, which means that when they pass legislation, the Democratic governor, our governor, Governor Cooper, can veto the legislation. And we have enough Democrats in the legislature to be able to uphold, we could call it sustain, sustain his veto. Uh, but if we lose four or five seats in, in the House and Senate uh, in North Carolina, we will lose our ability to protect the governor's veto. You got way too much knowledge and expertise to retire. What's next? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I get asked that every day, all day. I've even been asked that by the president of the United States. Uh, I, I am, my mind is made up, as we used to say down in, down in the country. My mind is made up. I'm not changing my mind. It, the time has come. I know the time has come. I know it very well. I'll be 75 years old in April. Uh, the doctor says I'm in very good health for a man my age. Uh, and so I think it's time to smell the roses a little bit and, and get out of the frying pan. And so that's what I'm going to be doing, getting out and probably doing some public service work, maybe some speaking, some lecturing. Uh, I may, uh, may go into a few college campuses and lecture across the country. But I'm excited about the future because, as you say, I have a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge, a lot of personal knowledge, and I want to write a book. You know, I've already started writing the book, and uh, my consultants told me I need to write two books. I need to write one, first of all, on the unique history of my hometown, of which I am the expert, if you will. But I've also have memoirs that I need to write, and one of which is my association with the National Council of Negro Women. I have a picture of 1941 of the National Council meeting in Washington. My mother and Mary McLeod Bethune in the picture. That was before I was born, uh, but I need to need to write about it. I need to talk about it, and I need to document our history. At this point, what we'd like to do is we've got several questions in the chat and we're going to try our best to give answers, but as um, Dr. Ale Ruffin Alexander has already said, if we don't get a full answer, we will get, we will continue to have this discussion. This is not a one-time thing. Um, I want to thank the NCNW Executive Committee members. I see so many of you on the call tonight. Cheryl Brown, Linda Bagley, Helena Johnson is one of our vice presidents. She's here tonight. Cheryl P. Brown has a question. What is the best way for us as citizens 
to put the likes of Senator Cruz, Cotton, and all, and others on notice that we will not put up with unfair, partisan, and racist attacks on Honorable Katanji Brown Jackson. The best way you can do it is to take, I think, is to take the social media. We sent a letter, issued an open letter, and I say we, NCNW issued an open letter, and there were lots of open letters, but I am so proud that of our 32 affiliated organizations, the AME missionaries, the AME Zion missionaries, the Deltas, the Zetas, SG Row, AKAs, about 20 of our 32 affiliates signed on to that letter. That made me proud. So you can sign on to a letter. There's going to be an op-ed that comes out in the Washington Post and or the New York Times. That's another way to express yourself. People are traveling to Washington. We may not get tickets to be inside the room, but we're gonna be present and let our presence be felt. So those are some of the ways that you can put them on notice. The other thing that you can do is make sure that we elect people who represent us so that we eventually replace the cruises and cottons of the world because it's not just them, it's them and their ilk. Linda Bagley has a, would anybody, uh, Jocelyn, would you yes. care to comment about that? Yes, yes I please would. Do. Another thing that you can do um, is call your, call your senators, call them and let them know. They log those calls. And actually the black women leaders and allies uh, group that we formed uh, will be having a call-in day on March the 23rd, where you can <clears throat> call in to your senators. Let's break that switchboard down. Let's clog up that switchboard with calls and let them know that we do not want them to hold up and hinder the confirmation hearing for Judge, Judge Jackson. And so you that's another method, social media and, call, and calling. Absolutely. And of course, you can come join us Thursday in front of the Supreme Court where we will be. And you can support NCNW, Black Women's Roundtable, Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda. You can support some of these organizations that are trying to do the fight. And let's take it personally. This is not somebody else's fight. This is our fight. Linda Bagley from New York, aka from New York, says what, and NCNW Executive Committee member, what is the marketing strategy to promote Democratic candidates and to support President Biden? It appears that Republicans have control of messaging and swaying public opinion. I will say what Democrats say, it's always about the economy. When people are nervous about their money, when people don't know how they're going to pay their student loan debts, when the price of gas and groceries keeps going up and up, you're going to have some some difficult days with the polling. But I think we can overcome that if we do the work, do the work that um, Reverend Freeman was talking about, that Helen Butler so famous for. We got to all start being a little bit more activists in our approach to this. And if you live in New York or if you live in California, where things are relatively better, just know that when Georgians elect a senator who cares, that helps the whole country. The United States Senate governs the entire country, not just the, the state that they represent. Jocelyn, what do you say about that? I agree with you completely, Janice, completely. We, that, I, I, I can't, I, you, you said it best, I can't, can't even add any more to it. We shouldn't have let Donna, Donna Brazil still had to go to another meeting, but she is one of the strategists. She and Mignon Moore are working closely with the White House. I will say, even in the Barack Obama days, I didn't get invited to as many conference calls and meetings about strategy as I'm getting right now. So it's not because this administration doesn't know or doesn't care. It's just that people are under there. We've got some mass hypnosis but you know, it's starting to break up. You're starting to see people say, wait a minute, how can we be talking about democracy in, in, for the Russians and undermining democracy for Americans? 
is starting to dawn on people, I believe. I just have that faith. Helena Johnson says, what are the different ways we can join the movement that counts for everyone, not just one region of the country? When it's good for the South, when it's good for the Midwest, it's good for California too. California leads by example on so many different issues. We could do away with the electoral college. We could do away with states' rights, but I think that's gonna be a longer struggle. Uh, Attorney Man, yes. can we take down the picture so that they can see you. They want to see you. They want to see me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm nothing to look at. Um, <laughs> and, and let me add this too, Janice. Um, about what I was earlier talking about our Black women's leaders and allies uh, call in day to the U.S. Senate. Let me give you that phone number so yes. that you know exactly where to call. That number is 202-224-3121. That's 202-224-3121. A switchboard operator will connect you directly to your senator's office, the senator's office that you request, and let them know. Um, when they get these calls, we want to break down, we want to clog up the switchboard on March the 23rd. That's correct. And I think this coming, isn't it one day this week that we're going to do social media? Aren't we going to yes, do a social media storm? Is that Friday or Wednesday? One That's day. On March the 16th, we'll be March doing a social media takeover with the hashtag confirm Judge Jackson. So that'll be confirm Judge Jackson Day, our social media takeover day. Use the hashtag on your social media sites and your social media uh, platforms, confirm Judge Jackson. Do we have any other, uh, thank you for that, Jocelyn, that is so important. Do we have any other unanswered questions in the chat? Mr. Johannes and tech team, Ms. Allen, can you tell us, or we have any other questions that need to be attended to? And thank you all for the wonderful comments. And One of the things that you can do is you can listen to me and Davida on Sunday night on the radio when we talk about this stuff every week. We've had Melanie on, we've had uh, Butterfield on, we've had Marsha Fudge on. We, it's an hour from 7.30 to 8.30. But we talk about this stuff every Sunday night. And, and let me just say, Janice, and I, I know probably the people on this, on this uh, in this gathering probably know it but for those who are listening that don't really have really connected the dots voting is at the core why, why do we talk so much about voting and we're in the streets about voting and we started the black women's leaders and allies uh, 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 to get voter protection the reason that we do that is because voting is at the core of every right and issue that touches our lives who we vote for who we elect and put into office to determines everything that touches our lives from the from the dog catcher that we elect to, to to all of the other issues that affect our lives. You just heard Congressman Butterfield talking about the legislature and the gerrymandering. Well, that those maps of those those gerrymandered maps were put in place by people who we who were elected. So that's why. We talk about it, we march about it, we're in the street because voting touches every area of, of your life. That's why it's so important and we have to hold on to it. We have to protect it and can't take let anyone take it away. And we and have to hold our elected officials accountable. I think exactly. they just come home, go to their office and nobody calls them or nobody goes by. But you, if you will help elect them, you have to hold them accountable. It appears that once they get to Washington and get in that seat, they forgot who put them in office. We have to hold them accountable. That is so very true. Somebody says in the chat that voting was hard fought to attain and requires the same dedication to retain it. Sounds like truth to me. Are there any other unanswered questions? If not, we're not gonna hold you unnecessarily. I would say, just pay attention to what's going on. I know you all are dedicated. I know you're smart. I know you're committed to our community. 
if you want to get rid of the student loan debt, which is a travesty, then we need better elected officials. If, if whatever your issue is, if you think we need more money for housing, if you think we need more money for health care, if you think we need better libraries, we need better black history talk, whatever your issue is in this democratic system, when it works the way it's supposed to, you get it by expressing your opinion at the polls. And in order to do that, we have to be enlightened. But you all are the leaders. You come with the army. You got friends and family and nieces and nephews and children and grandchildren and church members and club sisters. But you're at the point of the spear. When you get motivated, the rest of our community will too. I love you. I appreciate you. I see Andrew Casey. I'm going to copy the chat comments and keep them so that we will be able to share them because they are really just wonderful. If our hearts and minds are clear, I'm reminded of something. Johnson, let me get some final comments from you as our partner in the Black Women Leaders and Allies. Well, I just want, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much, Janice. And um, it was an honor to try to fill, uh, fill uh, Melanie's shoes tonight. She, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a big, it's, it was an honor and it's a big responsibility and I don't take it lightly. Um, just for, from Black Women Leaders and Allies, we formed this organization, as Janice told you, um, in this last summer. And it's been a labor of love and dedication and we will keep the fight. We will keep fighting for to protect our voting rights. Uh, we fought for the infra infrastructure bill being passed. Um, we were out in the streets for that. And we're out in the streets still for voting rights. We were out in the streets for, for George Floyd, passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And we're here to get uh, the confirma a confirmation hearing for, for Judge Jackson. Um, we're here. We want you to join us. Um, we have several activities in our day of our, in our month of action, actually. And if you don't mind, Janice, if I can just give them a brief overview of them and tell them where to go so that they can find more information. Absolutely, um, please do. Okay, on um, March the 9th, the Black Women's Roundtable, we're having our annual summit, our Women of Power National Summit. We'll be having a town hall. Um, that we'll, we'll be talking about Black women owning their power from the ballot box to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2022. Um, that will be, uh, it will be a, a, a hybrid event for those who are registered for the summit. It will be, they will be in person and then there will be, we'll, we will have it online as well. Um, you can go to um, blackwomensroundtable.org and get more information. Also, we already talked about March 10th when we will be having our Black Women and Allies confirm Judge Brown Jackson and voting uh, Judge uh, Brown Jackson and Voting Rights Day of Action Speak Out. It'll be in front of the Supreme Court. Um, we'll have again our March 16th. We'll have our Social Media Takeover Day. Hashtag to use is Confirm Judge Jackson. Use Confirm Judge Jackson. And then make those phone calls. Make those phone calls on March 23rd for our Black Women and Allies Take Action Call-In Day to the U.S. Senate. Make sure you call in at that number, 202-224-3121. And then on March the 30th, our, young, our youth will be taking over. They'll be having a spill, the, what they call a spill the tea day. And they'll be talking about uh, confirming Judge Jackson. They'll be using the hashtag confirm Judge Jackson. Uh, and that will be they'll be in the Twitter space. They'll be on Twitter. So that's our month long activities uh, for this month. We encourage you to join us. Uh, for those who are saying, what do we do? Where do we go? These are all the ways that you can join us in our in our work to take action to protect our voting rights, to confirm uh, J Judge, J Judge Jackson. And, and all the other activities that we have been doing and things that we've been passionate about that get passed in the Congress and in any other issues that are affecting the Black community. So with that said, Janice, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Jocelyn, can you give the website, is it 
What, what is the, the website is blackwomentakeaction.org. Black women take action. Blackwomentakeaction.org. And that's where you will find all of the information that I just shared with you. And we did record this session tonight. As a matter of fact, it's going to be rebroadcast by Roland Martin at some point, and it will live on our YouTube channel. If you are, well, I'm not gonna put it that way. I need you all to do something for me. Follow and like NCNW on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever, Clubhouse, wherever you are online. And don't just follow headquarters, follow each other because you're doing some amazing things. That's how I know all this stuff, because I follow you. So follow each other so that we can really make this network good and strong so we can do what we need to do. Dr. Ruffin Alexander, thank you so much for being here. Would you care to have a few closing comments? Uh, thank you, Attorney Mathis, for inviting me. Thank you to each of the panelists and to those affiliates that I invited. I see you out there. Thank you for joining us. I encourage you to go back to your sections, to your chapters, to your groups, and make sure that they are empowered to do what it takes. Now, most of the people that I invited were from Georgia. But there are some people that I invited from Texas, from California, and around the other states. You do what you need to do in your state so that you can make a difference. For Georgia, we have something on our hands, and you will be hearing more from the National Council of Negro Women in the weeks to come about what we're going to do to ensure that we have a fair and prosperous election. Thank you again. Thank you. You reminded me that I was on a call earlier today led by Le Bishop Leah Dowtry from New York, and she encouraged us to host watch parties for the confirmation hearings that begin on the 21st of March and go through the 23rd. So we will be asking some of you who are able and willing to host watch parties around the country. All you need is a big screen and a list and some snacks and invite sisters to come and watch the confirmation hearings together. It's his start. It probably won't happen again in my lifetime, maybe not in yours. Yeah. And so we owe it to Judge Jackson and we owe it to our grandchildren to push her over this finish line and not let them abuse her. Reverend Denise Freeman, you can send me a bill for your <laughs> sermon tonight. Pastor Warnock told me one time, it's only fair that a workman gets paid for her hire Please take us out of here with a benediction. Yeah, this let me first say thank you for inviting me and, and thank you, Dr. Alexander, for that awesome introduction. And uh, to all the people who are out here, and my husband is, is on, as well as, as Ms. Butler and other friends uh, from Lincoln County and around Georgia. Um, Thank you all for what you do at NCNW. And if there's anything that we can do in the future, Dr. Darling Ruffin Alexander, uh, we'd love to um, start a, we let's have a conversation. We'd love we to have- I, I, I already have your information down to make a call to you. <laughs> Great. If our hearts and minds are clear, let us say amen. Thank you, Jesus. Until the next time uh, for NCNW to have us all together. Everyone be blessed, be well, and Godspeed. Good night. God bless you and good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.